Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me back. Um, I do have quite a large slide deck, so I'll just jump straight into it. We can we can tap forward twice, uh, two slides. Thanks, guys. Um, obviously, we this is listed. One, uh, one more slide, please. This is um, being posted on the ASX under uh, our code ELT. And um, yeah, please read the cautionary and disclosure statements. Uh, since we're last uh, on, on Share Cafe and, and what we announced to the market on Monday this week was our uh, absolute material increase to our um, resource uh, at our flagship project in Spain, the Oropesa Tin Project. We have a, um, sorry, could we go back one slide, please? We've had a 50% increase to our, our mineral resource, uh, which is uh, measured, indicated and inferred. And most importantly to us seeing we're moving to a de definitive feasibility study is the fact that our measured and indicated categories, which are the key uh, geological categories that feed into a DFS and into an ore reserve statement, uh, is a 78% increase. So absolutely uh, significant uh, change in scale of, of the minerals that we are uh, estimating in the ground. In addition to that, another major economic uh, factor for us has been the increase in the shallow, shallow mineralization that we've defined. Previously about 1.37 million tonnes, we're up now to just under 5 million tonnes, which really should um, um, you know, add to the economics when we're able to assess it and um, announce it to the ASX. So if we just go to the next slide, thanks. So again, there's just a little bit more data there of the three categories that make up the measured indicator in third, but I'm happy to um, push Push past this one. Next slide. So, yeah, I've just been at the conference all this week, and and it's uh, it's not uncommon for people to come to me and say, well, this looks like a really good story, but I just don't know about tin, and I'm not offended at all. Tin is a is a small mineral in terms of the in the size globally, but but it's an extremely important one. This slide was put together by Rio Tinto and MIT University a couple of years ago. And they forecast that tin was going to be the most impacted metal by the electrification move away from the you know, um, traditional engines and move into smart infrastructure, green infrastructure, etc. The key reason for that is tin is the predominant mineral in solders. Solders are the electrical contacts which connect all the smart uh, items within electrical circuit boards, semiconductors and the rest of electrical infrastructure. So it is the electronic glue. You can't get away that huge quantities of it are gonna be required as we move into you know, electrified tomorrow. Uh, next slide, please. So when uh, Rio Tinto put that slide out a couple of years ago, tin price was down about $12,000 a tonne. Uh, people probably thought it was a nice bit of academic work, but really over the last 12 months following COVID, um, the tin market has, has boomed and the pricing's really moved up where the tin bulls and, and tin companies like ourselves that foresaw this demand always thought it probably should be. So right now um, on this chart, we've got tin price at $38,000 a tonne. That's a tripling from the lows from a couple of years ago and we've moved over 100% throughout this year itself. Um, uh, we're trading at 39,000 today, so it's even higher. It's one of the minerals you, you enjoy waking up to and seeing how it traded on, the, on London overnight because it generally always goes higher. And it's fair to say in the Chinese market, there's a significant premium to the London market, currently trading at $7,000 a tonne, so $45,000 a tonne, so a massive premium right now in, in China. Next slide, please. The, the key reason, a couple of key reasons that I'll fly through for this is, is one, global tonnage is, uh, have abs inventories uh, at the major warehouses are, are down to nothing. Um, tin's in its fourth year of deficits, and we're down to about uh, a, less than a day in the London uh, exchange warehouses of, of global demand, and down to about a, just over a day in, in the Shanghai warehouses. So um, down to about two days in total, which is just uh, all-time lows. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so again, another key reason why uh, you know, it looks like there's been a step change and things are here to stay. Uh, it's forecast, and this is data from the International Tin Association, is that uh, supply is just not going to be able to keep up with demand uh, in the foreseeable future up to 2030. Up to a couple of months ago, they were predicting the, the long-term average growth rate of 1.8% on, on tin demand. And even then, the, the market wasn't going to be able to keep up with it. Recently, based on um, demand and the electrification and you know, your automation um, uh, infrastructure and this um, technology super cycle we seem to be moving into, uh, they've increased their estimates three to four percent. So, forecasting a fifty to seventy thousand ton shortfall of tin metal moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we'll just skip this one. Thank you. 
Uh, Element Health has recently put out its ESG, first ESG uh, statement, and we're really um, yeah, uh, focused on this, and there'll be a lot more from us uh, on this moving forward as we develop our two projects. Uh, next slide, please. So Oropay's TIM project is our flagship project. It's the project that I just updated you on the resources. It's in the Andalusia region in southern Spain, which is the maturest, uh, the most mature um, mining region in Spain. It's had uh, mines operating there for thousands of years and certainly got some major players um, operating in the region right now. Uh, the most, uh, one of the most significant uh, stories right now is the Sandfire Resources has bought into the Matza Mining Complex, a, a copper mine only 60 kilometres from, from our project. Certainly great to see another big Australian miner moving into the region and um, it gives a lot of support to the environment, uh, the environment and the regime that we currently work with in southern Spain, which is, is relative support, supportive compared to other places in Europe. Uh, next slide, please. So just in summary, this is just a visual from the resource that we, that, that we announced. Uh, we've just highlighted the additional mineralization that's coming in close to surface. Uh, certainly a lot of significant mineralization close to surface, which means we should be able to get a lot of it out at quite low strip ratios, uh, which is quite material uh, change from, from the scoping study we put out uh, early last year. Next slide, please. So uh, we'll fly through these ones. Uh, next slide, please. We're, uh, in addition to the resource, we're moving forward a, a whole bunch of uh, other technical work streams that'll feed the feasibility. We've got MET test work uh, currently finishing up in, in Cornwall in the UK. Next slide, please. We've got geotech uh, drill rigs currently uh, working on site. We're about 80% of the way through that drilling program. Next slide, please. Uh, we're also doing some groundwater drilling works, uh, hydrogeology works uh, on site. Um, yep, next slide, please. I'm really flying through these guys, apologies, but this is available on the ASX if you want to see more detail. So this is the program we're working through to get the, this thing through a feasibility study, um, through a feasibility study and, and get it financed and into production. So we, we're planning on getting that feasibility study completed by the end of 2022, moving into finance and construction in, in 2023. So yeah, we've got there, we've announced the resource, which is on that line. Our other technical program should be in by Q1. We then move into really detailed uh, mine planning, packaging, get all our CapEx and OpEx estimates ready uh, and put them together and, and package that up for the, um, for the end of the DFS, the end of 22. And in parallel to that, we're uh, submitting our uh, environmental uh, documentation and mining lease application, uh, which should be uh, ready soon after, just into the first stage of 2023. Uh, move, next slide, please. So we put out an economic study in um, May last year. Uh, as you see, we, we were getting a quite a nice uh, MPV there, 92 million US, 25% IRR. But what I should just highlight is that was done on a under a $20,000 tin price, and we had all in sustaining costs of just under $12,000 a ton. If you move to the next slide, obviously the tin price has gone significantly up. So not um, taking into account any other of the project maturation or the increased resource that we've just announced. Uh, just running at current spot prices, we're, you know, we're getting you know, roughly a 650 million Australian MPV, currently trading at 100 million MPV on the stock exchange. Uh, and this is one of our two major projects that we've got. So um, definitely some upside there, we believe, for our investors. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, we believe we sit pretty low on the cash cost curve, and that's obviously very important when you're a miner like ourselves to, to defend against future price drops. Key reason for that, we, we are an open pit deposit. Uh, deepest part of our pit's about 200 metres, as I said, a fair bit of mineralisation above 100 metres. We, uh, our mineralisation is cassiterite, which is realistically the only economic uh, tin, tin mineralisation you really want to be mining. Our, what is also important is our tin mineralisation is hosted in sandstones and conglomerates, not in the granites and the permangatites, which other, uh, some of the other tin producers uh, are sitting on assets that they're much more challenging, much more expensive to extract the tin from, from those ore bodies. Uh, moving along, next slide, please. So our second project is the Cleveland Tin Project. This is located in Tasmania. It was an old operating tin mine, uh, closed in 1986 when the international tin price dropped away. Um, effectively, this was shut down. Still got a very nice looking jork resource there from areas that weren't mined. We've got 7.5 million tonnes of ore. 
at about 0.75% grade, slightly higher grade than our open pit, which is fine because the cost of mining underground is always you know, slightly higher as well. Got some pretty nice copper credits and copper is doing very nicely in the global markets right now. And at the bottom, we've got a, uh, uh, we've historically, they just drilled the top of, of a very nice looking tungsten deposit. Not enough uh, drill holes at that depth to define that any further, but something that excites us for, for blue, blue sky opportunities in the future. Um, next slide, please. So pretty much we've just got a bit of data on what that historic mine looks like. It's at about 500 metres of working, about 150 metres above the portal entry, about 250, uh, 350 metres below. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty modern mine, uh, modern equipment can get down it. Uh, we've currently done a strategic review on that with the results to be announced to the market uh, soon. And um, yeah, we've also got a drill program. If you flip to the next slide, uh, new drill program down there, which will be putting four to five holes into that deposit. Uh, early next year when, when drill rigs become available. They're, they're a pretty uh, hard commodity to get hold of at the moment all around Australia. And um, this is just a few indications of where we'll be drilling. It's four holes along strike, uh, which we, you know, we've got some pretty good data that makes us uh, hopeful we'll, we'll um, hit some more mineralization. Next slide, please. Just as a summary of uh, our market cap, uh, you know, we, we cleared our debt in the last quarter currently got about $5 million worth of cash and another a bunch of options to come in next year that has us well funded uh, yeah, it's for all these activities into the next year. Tim, I'm happy to finish that up now. The guys can have a look at the few remaining slides uh, later on. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate this is your presentation from the Noosa Mining Conference. And you've <laughs> it was. You caught me. Ah, there you go. That helps. Um, now, just back on that uh, Cleveland project, which is obviously based in Australia. Australia's recently yeah. announced a a $2 billion critical minerals financing facility to support the development of critical min minerals. Tin fits in that, um, in that area. Do you, do you think you could get funding that way? Yeah, we've spoken to Ethic, uh, who's managing this on behalf of the government already. Unfortunately, right now, uh, Tin does not sit on the, st the strategic minerals list or critical minerals list of Australia. It does sit on the list for the US, the UK, the EU, Japan and most of the Asian countries. So, you know, we've had some conversations uh, recently with Geosciences Australia and we're pretty hopeful um, that, that we might make the revised list uh, moving forward. Uh, it is on a sort of a secondary list that sits there. So it's definitely being watched by the government, but unfortunately we don't quite, uh, at least the tin in our deposit doesn't um, fit the list, but tungsten does. So, um, you know, we do have tungsten at the bottom of that Cleveland deposit. So it's something to continue uh, engaging with the government on. And uh, even though you've had just recently had a resource upgrade, is there a chance there any further exploration upside? Have you closed the resource off? Yeah, no, it's, it's not closed off. Um, there's certainly some additional uh, drilling we can do. We're actually hopeful some of our geotech holes have driven it, dr uh, drilled in the pit wall might get us a little bit more geotech information on, on some of those targets. So we're always looking for data. Um, yeah, no, it's open and we've got regional prospectivity within the tenement, um, you know, away from the current drilling. So we're pretty excited that that uh, Spanish project will, will get larger as well. And, and I spoke about at the beginning, the kind of cost price inflation and pressure that's coming through the supply chain. Do you see that uh, in any of your projects, particularly, you, you know, you did an economic study back in May 2020. It's got to be updated. Can you balance that off against a, you know, a surging tin price? Yeah, absolutely. At the moment, there's so much margin in that tin price. But I think it's fair to say most miners, when you're running your, your, your you're hoping your revenue is, you know, significantly a gap to, to what your cost base is. So, you know, assuming those lines move somewhat, um, uh, you know, your revenue line's always at a higher base than your cost line. So hopefully inflation and pressure should be a positive for miners. But of course, disproportional escalation in your cost to your revenue would, would obviously be hurtful. And just finally, um, you recently joined the European Raw Materials Alliance. Can you tell us what that is and, and how does that help you with your Spanish project? Yeah, hey, I think it's, it's fair to say most people have looked at global mining projects, understand the European Union as, you know, as a whole is, is somewhat a quite highly regulated place to do business. Not something that scares us off, it's just they uh, make you tick a lot of boxes. This is effectively European Union's um, assistance package to that. So they, they're really helping good groups like ourselves, which are on their critical minerals list, including tin, to, to you know, connect government, industry. You know, they, they would ideally like a lot of their supply chains to stay within Europe, you know, off-taking, so we'd be selling our off-take to, to European-based smelters, of which there's plenty. 
Uh, and we're happy to, to work with the government. They do provide a lot of support down into the Spanish uh, government level as well. If you're having any challenges with certain approvals or whatever, they will, um, they'll support you and I guess remind everyone that um, getting tin projects up in Spain, uh, sorry, in the, in the European Union is, is very important.